so thank you for having me here. Um, I'm on a mission to change the way that we think and that we talk about typography by making it exciting for everybody. So often when I say the T word, typography, people think that I'm talking about a specialist or a niche subject, and I disagree. I think of it more like a not-so-secret code that's hidden in plain sight, and it's a code that all of us already know how to read. So from shop signs to food packaging, from your favorite book cover or your favorite movie poster, I think that typography is the magical and the wondrous language of our everyday lives. So as part of this mission, uh, one of the things I do is I explore how the actual shapes of the letter forms themselves um, have the potential to alter our experiences and how understanding this better can actually help or could lead to positive behavior change. By co-opting the language of consumerism and literally pointing it in a slightly different direction, I think, I believe that we can make the world a better place. Big lofty ambitions. So I spend a lot of my time um, talking about this outside of the design world, because if I want to make this change happen, this is very much where I need to be. And also because I do lots of, re lots of research, lots of experiments, also I want the answers from people who, who aren't thinking about typefaces day in and day out. And so one of the first things that tends to happen when I talk about typography is once you get past the kind of rabbit in headlights, the kind of shock look of, oh no, don't talk to me about this, is the first question is usually, but what is typography? And at this point, I have two choices. I can either launch into a monologue about typefaces or typography as a series of symbols that have developed over millennia and basically deliver a lecture that will prove, um, prove all of their, everybody's fears, um, or, I can invite the people who've asked me the question to join in and actually prove it for themselves or discover it for themselves. So because you've all had lunch and I want to wake you all up for the rest of the day, I thought I'm going to invite all of you to join in this game. So this is the game that I usually play at the beginning of my workshops, at the beginning of my talks. Somehow I have this idea I'm so tall, I'm blocking my slides. <laughs> I'm really not, am I? Um, so. I'm going to ask you all to join in with this, and before I start, I just want to make sure that all of you are feeling in fine voice, and that all of you are ready to join me in a game of typography karaoke. Are you ready? Yeah. Yay! Excellent. And I get... <laughs> so, what I would like you to do for the next few slides is literally say what you see, and if anybody feels like actually singing them, then you're ever so welcome. <laughs> but just speaking it or shouting it is completely fine. So, three, two, one. <laughs> Fabulous, thank you. You are my wonderful typography karaoke choir. And I think that we've proven that typography is your voice. So this is something I do with students. This is typographic life drawing. And I get them to sketch out what different voices sound like. Now, this might accidentally be very loud, so prepare yourself. Hello, what do you want? Hello, what do you want? Hello, what do you want? All right, just start. <laughs> Hello, what do you want? <laughs> Hello, what do you want? And you can very easily work out which of the sketches matched each of the different voices. So this is not a font, but I'm also not being pedantic. This is also not a typeface, in my opinion. No, and not for that reason either. In my opinion, it is a personality, an attitude, an idea, a story, a, um, a taste, um, a smell, a warning, a seduction, 
when we read something, we generally look straight past the letter forms, we look past the words, we don't really think about them. What we do is we engage, we interact with the experience that they're referring to. And somehow the combination of the words and the letter forms bring this to life. Marcel Proust talks about an experience that he had as an adult where he ate a Madeleine, take, uh, Madeleine, a Madeleine cake. I didn't even drink Prosecco at lunchtime. <laughs> How many of you know the story about Proust and the Madeleine cake? It doesn't matter. Oh, yeah, quite a few hands. Excellent. So he ate this Madeleine cake, and suddenly, as he ate, as he ate it, all of these um, memories of childhood came flooding, flooding back. And they weren't specific memories. It was just this, these sense memories, this just feeling of childhood. And in my opinion, typefaces do a very similar thing. If you discover a sweet wrapper from when you were a child, um, it can very easily transport you back to that, that giddy, saccharine sweetness of childhood. Or if you discover food packaging or packaging from a misspent youth or your parents' misspent youth, this one makes my mum tell funny stories, um, you will suddenly hear tales, but not the really big, grand stories. You will hear these small stories of everyday life that reveal so much more about that person and that, their background. And if you're living somewhere far, far away and you walk into a shop and it sells products from your home country, it can suddenly give you this flood of nostalgia that takes you back to, to homesickness or home and memories. So this, looking very big, um, is my, one of my best friends, Miho, who's actually much smaller than me, so that's quite funny. Um, so she grew up in Michigan in the US, and she's lived in London for the last 15 years. And this is when we discovered the Foods of America aisle in Selfridges shop in the middle of London. And when we first walked down this aisle, she was getting really excited and telling me about all of these products and birthdays and different times that she'd eaten all of these things. Um, and of course, when I took my camera out, she was like, no, I'm going to pose sensibly. <laughs> I'd much rather, I wish I'd had it out for her to see her getting all excited. Um, and it's really wonderful because it gave me this lovely insight into her everyday life or the life before I knew her. So how on earth do we learn all of these codes? It's not like we go to semiotics of typography school um, or we have textbooks that we actually have to learn. Somehow, we know all of these codes, we know all of these associations really automatically and really instinctively. So I spoke about this at a talk a few years ago, and at the end, I received a tweet. So Sandra tweeted me about her daughter, Anna. And so Anna is four years old, and apparently Anna says that their family car comes from Boots the Chemist. So this is the Boots the Chemist logo. So, anybody feel brave enough to shout out what you think the make of family car is? Ford. I'm just going to keep doing I'm going to make you do all the work so I can stand here and just... Yes, Ford. So, hands up who agrees that it's a Ford. Absolutely. Um, so, their, their family car is indeed a Ford. And I do quite a lot of work now with Professor Charles Spence. Um, so, he's a professor from Oxford University. And so, he's quite often the first person I will call or go to when things like this happen. Um, and Charles says that actually this starts from as young as six months old. So as soon as you're starting to make visual sense of the world, you're starting to make these connections, um, you're going to start connecting these logos, these letter forms. And as, as life, as we grow up and as we have more and more experience, we gradually build up this really comp complex, really comprehensive encyclopedia or like a dic visual dictionary in our brain of all of these associations. Um, and I think it's the brain is really quite miraculous and really quite wonderful for doing this. So when, quite often when I'm in my studio and I talk about this, I play a game. Here's where I just show, and I've got my hands too full. Um, so I play a game and I usually have a record player. So I bring this along and I have a pile of vinyl records. I've taken all the labels off and I've replaced the labels with a single letter and each letter is in a different typeface. And I've matched these typefaces to what I think are the appropriate musical genres. You then guess what music might be on the record. You put it on the turntable, you put the headphones on, and you see if you're right, although, of course, there are kind of no right or wrong answers. Now, when I first started doing this, I thought it was quite obvious what music matched some of these. And so we're just going to play this game with one of these records. 
So if I show you this record, what kind of music do you all think is on this record? Anybody feel like shouting out? Ooh, really wide range, um, which kind of demonstrates the shock that I was in store for, the surprise that I was in store for. So I'm going to ask you to put your hands up if you agree with what I have paired this with, which is... <laughs> so, in fact, this is Motorhead. I can see quite a few hands up when then, went up there. But I took this game along to play with, there's a blog called It's Nice That. Um, I'm sure quite a few of you read it. And most of the, the journalists there, most of the writers are kind of in their 20s. And so when they played it and they heard it was heavy metal, they all kind of looked at me and looked me up and down and sort of worked out that I probably wasn't their age. And they were all like, no, it's hip hop, it's Kanye. I should cut that clip shorter. Um, then I, I thought, this is really interesting. Actually, uh, this is kind of confronting my assumptions. So I then asked my, my um, nieces, who are 11 and 13. And of course, their answer was, it's Taylor. Taylor Swift, the rest of us, of course. And of course, this is when she was, her designers were referring, possibly referring to the, her ongoing feud with Kanye West, or they're referring to the news coverage that using that is going to get, who knows. Um, my uncle said Wagner, I think I might have heard somebody shout Wagner in the audience. And then because I knew that I was going to be talking about this, um, three weeks ago, two or three weeks ago, I, on social media, I initiated an extremely serious scientific social media study where I asked lots of people what associations they, they would make, and these were all the top answers. Um, and there's even more, so Mexican scar. Um, so all of these associations that I really wouldn't have made, and this was such an incredibly good lesson to me that um, my associations are my own personal cultural associations and they don't relate to everybody. So to actually start asking more questions, especially when I'm creating anything for an audience that isn't me. <laughs> um, this, all of these experiments are still up on social media. So they're on Twitter, they're on Instagram. Later on, I'll show you my, um, the handle, the, um, how you can find them and I would love it if you all went and added your answers to, to this one and there's a few other questions that I'm going to put up in a little while. So who am I and why the heck am I doing this? So what I really enjoyed this morning was hearing that I'm not the only person that has this existential crisis about why I'm doing all of this weird research and um, I have this real bee in my bonnet about what I'm doing. So I am Sarah Hindman. Um, I've been a graphic designer for about 20 years, um, over 20 years. I ran my own design company for a decade of this with some really lovely clients. And then six years ago, I got to the point where I just had kind of had enough and I'd fallen out of love with being a designer or I'd fallen out of love with managing a business, more to the point. And I needed to step away and do something that made me fall back in love with it again. And I decided I was going to take one year out six years ago, so I'm still going, and I set up this thing called type tasting. So the idea was to create um, typographic versions of wine tasting, so to make type, to, to create some social environments that would, in which people could learn about typography, but in a, a kind of fun and um, social setting. And I started looking for lots of research and a lot of the kind of questions I had, there, weren't, there wasn't that much research out there or a lot of it had been done quite a long time ago or it used typefaces that as designers we really wouldn't use. And um, so I'd studied sciences at school, but this is like schoolgirl science. This really doesn't prepare me for proper scientific study. I'm a graphic designer. Um, but in my, I guess, my naivety almost, I thought, yes, let's go and do lots of experiments and find out. And so for the last six years, one of the big learning curves has been learning how to actually run credible experiments, working with Professor Charles and various other scientists, um, working really with in an interdisciplinary way. So I work with perfumers and chefs and psychologists and semioticians, 
which means that we have really interesting conversations that step outside the kind of normal design typography world conversations. And we also create really mad experiments. Um, I've now, in this last six years, I've now written three books. This is the, the first book that wanders around the world causing mischief. People send me photos of it, um, getting on aeroplanes and having, it has lovely holidays, much nicer holidays than I do. Um, and I was really excited that my first card game came out this year. I have another game that I play with audience is, audiences is a type dating game, which I thought I'd spare you today. Um, does anybody know the game Snog, Marry, Avoid? So the idea is if it's not wit, you would, you're given three, three options, and then you choose which one you would snog, which you would marry, which you would avoid. So my game is basically a card game version of Snog, Marry, Avoid with fonts. You have to find it. Um, I might have a copy with me. I'll bring it, if I have, I'll bring it down and we can play it later. Um, now, one of the really important things is public engagement. So if I'm going to, again, make this change and have these conversations outside of the design world, um, I need to do lots of events that engage people in all of, in what I'm talking about. Um, so we do these weird events. This is um, the pop-up lab. Um, which we set up at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, had this big room where we were getting people to come in and play lots of different games. And what I find is I have to make my experiments kind of really bonkers and a little bit fun, because that way more people are going to take part in them. And I also really want you to go away having, had, having done something that was a bit thought-provoking, but also having discovered how much you already know. Um, it's such a wonderful moment of revelation to see people go, oh my God, um, we've all answered the same thing, but we don't know why. And then when they start talking about it, they realize that it's all about these cultural codes and these references that, um, that everybody actually understands so instinctively. So this idea that everybody is already an expert, but it's a, it's a subconscious expert. This is, oh, this is my font selfie machine. Um, if you pick a typeface, I will give you a, your personality analysis based on your typeface. Um, as you can tell, people were kind of enjoying that one. And um, 3D glasses, they kind of run through everything I do. Uh, for me, they represent this kind of childlike curiosity, this, this belief in brain-powered, lo-fi magic. Um, and uh, they're also my font goggles, so you look through different lenses and they reveal different mysteries. So I've now been doing this research for six years, um, which means that I now have six years worth of results, of experiment, observations, of fails, successes that I need to share with the world because there's no point doing it if I'm not going to actually put it out there. Uh, I spent this year, or I'm in the process of looking for funding, applying for funding to get the experiments going, so in case I forgot to say it before, um, everything I do is self-funded and self-initiated, which means that I don't have to have a commercial agenda, but it also means that things move quite slowly and experiments have different, they, they take a while to unfold. So if any of you have ever applied for funding, you know that it's kind of quite a time-consuming process. And this is ongoing, um, but I'm impatient. So I've decided that um, as of three weeks ago, I decided that I'm just going to start publishing this, and I figure once you start putting it out there, then the funding, everything else will happen. So I'm going to start publishing these bi-monthly, small pamphlet-style books, and each one will focus on a different topic, look at it in detail, but it'll also show the process behind the experiments, so in theory you can go away and run these experiment for your, experiments for yourselves. Um, th so this is the logo that it exists as of only three weeks. It needs some tweaking, so please don't look too close. Too close. Um, so the, the books has makes that little nod to those 3D glasses. Um, anybody who bought my first ever self-published book, it came with a pair of 3D glasses or a pair of font goggles, so it is this little theme that runs through. And the overlap is a Venn diagram, just again a nod to the fact that it's research or experiments that run through everything. <laughs> I love that music. Um, so the very first one is the great jelly bean experiment. Um, this is one of the first experiments that I ran. So I first did it about five years ago. Um, and it's taken me five years to learn how to 
run an experiment and gather the right data uh, or gather the data in the right way that you can publish it as an official scientific study. So I kept being sent away, you didn't collect everybody's ages correctly or we can't pair the two jelly bean answers up. And then finally, last year, this was published as a, as a proper study, a collaborative study with Professor Charles Spence. Um, but of course, this gets published in the science world, and this is not, these are not things that designers would normally read. So one of the reasons for these publications is that they're going to be almost like the companion, the handbook to the scientific studies that will hopefully get into the hands of designers. So the idea for this experiment came from, so a lot of things, ideas come from when I, um, I read um, scientific studies and I think, oh, that's really interesting. So there's this, um, this is study by Dr. David Lewis. So Dr. David Lewis is kind of the godfather of consumer neuroscience. And he, uh, he did this experiment where he got two different groups of people. So, in fact, I could almost do it with you guys if I had some soup. Um, and half, of, well, he got everybody to taste a bowl of soup. They were in different rooms. And each of them had the description of the soup on a card in front of them. And what they didn't know was the, uh, the only thing that was changing was the typeface that was used on each of the descriptions. And what he discovered was that the group who ate the soup to one of the typefaces uh, they ended up rating it as tasting 64% tastier, fresher, and more enjoyable. Um, and you read something like this, and it's like, that's really incredible, that just a typeface alone can actually make that much difference. And then I started reading other studies, and um, there was one where if you look at a jagged shape, it will make something taste sourer. If you look at a round shape, it'll make something taste sweeter. And it's like, whoa. How about jagged and round typefaces? Can we do that? And so I thought, right, I'm going to start. I'm going to see if I can create a typographic gobstopper. You can tell my childhood was on 70s movies. Um, and so I was trying to work out what we can do this with. And it seemed like a jelly bean is the perfect thing to use because it comes in pre-mixed form, um, it's cheap enough, um, it's hygienic enough that nobody's going to worry about checking my kitchen, um, and in theory, each one tastes similar enough that it, they're standard for this experiment. But also, I really love the idea of using a jelly bean in a, in a, a formal scientific exp experiment, that, that, that contrast of childish silliness and, um, and science. And this has kind of taken me on some really interesting adventures. This is, we did a mass participation jelly bean experiment at the Science Museum. Um, if you want to run a really successful um, experiment or a really popular experiment, give people jelly beans. They were kind of, especially if they're drinking as well, they were queuing around the, around the um, museum for this. Um, for those of you who know who Heston Blumenthal is, it's also taken me to um, do experiments with him and his chefs in the Fat Duck Lab. Um, and just all of these really strange things, strange places that um, the graphic designer me of kind of six years earlier could, if you'd have told me, oh, in fact, if you'd have told me I'd be standing on this stage, it'd have been like, don't be silly. <laughs> and finally, after five years of gathering this data, <laughs> the study has been published. And now the fun thing about doing all of this research is now I can incorporate it into different events. So this is my wine and type wine and type tasting evening. Over the course of five courses of wine, I show you just how much what you taste is influenced by your preconceptions and all of your other senses. Um, this is the no spoiler moment where you have to have been there. What happens at a type tasting stays at a type tasting. And the really good fun thing is that I use the data to create the events. And then at the events, I gather more data so I can then refine um, and create new events, and it becomes this really beautifully kind of cyclical process. And I'd also like you to take part in this first publication. So it's going to be all about jelly beans. It's going to have the official study that I did, but also I really want to gather some fantastical flavors of jelly beans to include in it, um, where you are going to imagine what different typefaces might, might taste like. Um, on Instagram and on Twitter, I've got the links to this, and it links straight through to a study. So I would love it if you took part in this, or if you find me later, I can tell you where to find it. Um, 
So yes, please, um, all of these things are group efforts. So the same with all of my research. I can't do any of this without you because it can't just be my own opinions. And what began as just a jelly bean experiment has now turned into something that is, um, that's turned into a much bigger idea or a much bigger experiment. So um, I'm really interested in spending some time exploring how we can use typography to actually create nudge positive behavior change. So anything from if we can make something taste sweeter with a typeface, could we use a typeface to add a little bit of sugar through the packaging like a placebo without actually, and reduce the sugar content without affecting your, your experience of what it tastes like? Could we deconstruct the language of consumerism and use it to help you make better food or better informed choices? Could we co-opt the language of consumerism, point it in a different direction, and actually use it to create positive behavior change? So lots of things that will be really interesting to, to explore. Now, one of the, as I said, one of the ways I get ideas is I read studies or I read about studies. And this is quite a famous one. Um, if I give you a glass of wine and I tell you that the bottle it came from cost 90 euros, you will enjoy it dramatically more than if I tell you it only cost five euros. And those aspirins that you take them the next morning will be more effective if you think that they are the really expensive ones. So the whole placebo effect thing. Now, of course, I already know I can't test this out. So my idea is obviously, can I do? Can I make type wine more expensive with a typeface? Um, so I know that I can't just test this out by guessing at what expensive and cheap typefaces are. So I've got the first stage of this has got to be to do this study. So at this point, we're going to play a game show. So for the next few slides, what I would like you to do is shout higher or lower, depending on, um, depending on the card that I turn over on the top left, whether you think it represents a more expensive or a cheaper project, product. <laughs> it's that invisible Prosecco, that placebo Prosecco kicking in. Um, so if I turn this one over, do you think that's going to be higher, more expensive, or do you think that's going to be lower, cheaper? What do you think? Hands up lower. I think that was mostly lower. Yeah, okay. How about this one, higher or lower? That was fairly convincingly higher. How about this one, higher or lower? But, hands up A, hands up B. Oh, that's very, very evenly split, so I'm going to put it in A because that's how my presentation works. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but it's also, there's also a reason for it, which I'm going to come on to. Um, how about this one? Higher or lower? Lower in a low voice. And by process of elimination. Now, how many of you, if you can put your hands up, would like to move this one? Oh, a few hands. It's really interesting. Oh, no, quite a few more hands. You had to think about this. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so what's really interesting is I've been doing this as a demonstration, as an experiment for the last six years. And for the first five years, um, the order was fairly static. But in the last year, um, these top-end ones have started to shuffle around a little bit. Um, and so this is really interesting, the way this is. So if I when I talk to the semioticians, how this is starting to represent changes that are happening in the world about perception of premium. Um, and so the, the idea that type isn't static, that the associations, they evolve not only with our personal experiences, but also with changing tastes is really interesting. But for the process, for, the, um, for this, I'm just going to use the, the, the order that has been static for a number of years. Um, this again is the Victoria and Albert Museum. It was also an online survey, so I've had quite a few hundred people do it. And these are, this has been for a long time, the, the general order. The yellow ones are the ones that from the, one, the game that we just played. And what I think is really interesting is the one with the red arrow, the bold sans serif. In light of all of these kind of conversations about premium brands rebranding, will we start to see that shuffle up the, the scale as we sort of learn these new, asso uh, new associations? I have no idea. It's, I'll have to wait and see, and I will keep you posted. Oh, 
So, but I have my order. I've got my expensive typeface. I've got my cheap typeface. So I can now go and do this experiment. And the thing I learned really quickly is I probably can't do this with wine, not at the first stage of an experiment because it's expensive. Um, and also in terms of ethics, supplying lots of people with alcohol is probably going to not be that easy. So I decided to do it with chocolate. And I went along to this huge conference called Food Matters Live. And I was there with the scientists and the cross modalists. We all had this big stand. And so I had a bit of this stand and for three days ran this experiment. And I took along this lovely green and black chocolate, nice dark chocolate. And um, I asked people to taste it and to rate what they thought it tasted like. And what nobody knew was that every half an hour, I was switching the description and the instructions and the answer form from, one, from the expensive typeface to the cheap typeface. And so at the end of that first day, I went home, tallied up my results, and oh my god, it worked. People actually rated the chocolate as tasting better, tasting more premium, and said that they would actually pay more for it when they ate it to the expensive typeface. Like, wow. And so I went home, and the next day, went back again. And of course, the thing I'd forgotten I hadn't learned from the jelly bean experiment is if you give people chocolate, your experiment is really popular. So I'd run out of chocolate. So I thought, oh, I've blown my chocolate budget. I'm just going to go and get some cheap chocolate. So I went and bought Cadbury's Dairy Milk, ran the experiment again, went home that night, tallied up the results, and oh, not only had it not worked, but people had rated the chocolate that they ate to the expensive typeface as tasting even cheaper. And I didn't really understand why, what had happened. So it was Professor Charles, ring my, ring my phone a friend. And so what Charles very quickly explained was um, that you can't actually trick people. You can't make people, convince people that something cheap is actually expensive. Um, we have much better, um, Bullshit meters, I can't think of a, another word for that, sorry. Um, and so this was a really good lesson for me as a designer and also running all of these experiments that the anticipation, the promise that you establish through the packaging has to have some kind of congruence, it has to intersect with, it has to live up, to the actual experience itself has to live up to the promise on the packaging. So we've changed the taste of soup. We've changed the taste of a jelly bean. We've changed the taste of chocolate. What else, I wonder, can typefaces do? So one of the things that whenever I write about this or talk about this, um, when I talk about whether type can impact mood is one of the most popular posts that I will ever write about. So this is an area I wanted to look into. Um, so this refers to an experiment that was done by two psychologists. So this is Julie Gross and Samuel Juni. They gave two groups of people, a bit like the tomato soup experiment, two groups of people um, an article to read from the New York Times. And then they asked them at the end of it to rate how angry and funny this article was, so how satirical. And the half the people who read it in one typeface voted it, rated it as being funnier and angrier um, as being more satirical than the other typeface. So which one do you think would have been the satirical typeface? So hands up if you think A. Well, there's not many people. Hands up if you think B. Okay, so B wins by quite a landslide there. And in fact, that is correct. So those who read the article in Times New Roman rated it as being um, more satirical, as being angrier and funnier. And so I thought, this is really interesting, but of course, I can't just assume what different moods different typefaces will have. So like the Price is Right game or the, the cost experiment, I have to go away and work out what the baseline is. And I found out very quickly, if I just ask you what mood different fonts for different typefaces reflect, you overthink it. So the way that I do it is I confuse you. I get you to smell things and pair them with typefaces and to tell me stories. And the wonderful thing about smell is it's processed by the part of your brain that, is, that also processes memories and emotions. So if you want to tap into mood, um, it seems that this is really quite a good way to do it. Um, in, this, in the middle is um, Najib, the perfumer I do a lot of work with. He takes it very seriously. Um, this is, I tweeted this. And I'm sure you can imagine that Twitter had an opinion about which typeface the guy was smelling. Um, now, when I ask you to do this, usually I give you a selection of 30 or, four different typeface, 30 or 40 different typefaces, which 
um, if I try and do that now, we'll be take the rest of the week. So we're going to do it with just three. And so I would like you to imagine that I've just given you um, a jar of bubble gum to smell, that bright pink um, sweet bubble gum from your childhood. So imagine that you're smelling it and think about which typeface you would pair that smell with. So hands up if you think it would be A. Oh, no hands. Hands up if you think it would be B. Okay, that's quite a lot. Hands up, C. Any Cs? Ah, oh, there's usually one C. I don't know, it's like an auction, so it's slight waves. Um, so most people usually pick B. Um, C, if you picked C, that's usually actually if you really hated it, if it had some kind of aversive reaction. Um, so again, these are all on social media, and I would love it if you went and answered. So what I do is I get you to pair these, and then I ask you for a memory or a mood. So as I said, all of these are up there, so go and find them. And so again, this very scientific social media study, these were the responses. So everybody unanimously voted B on, on Twitter and Instagram. And these are some of the descriptions. So it's all saccharine, sickly, nostalgia, very grown-up words, a couple of grown-up words for childhood experiences. So another one. Imagine now I'm going to give you a jar, and it's full of chili flakes. So imagine the smell of chili flakes. And think about which of these typefaces you would pair with chili. So hands up if you would pair A. Oh, there's about five of you. Hands up, B. Uh, that's about another five of you. Hands up, C. Oh, lots and lots, lots of Cs. So, um, generally, I find when I ask people who've picked B, they will usually describe that they think that they associate the smell with kind of really creamy curries with lots of depth of flavor. So it's not so much about the spice, it's about the creaminess um, and, the, and the, the, the depth of flavor of it. Um, C, usually, if I ask, it'll either be because you think, oh, that's going to be hot, ooh, um, maybe you're not that much of a fan of spicy food, or you're the kind of person that loves those super-duper hot vindaloos because you really love the buzz of the, of the, really, of the strong, hot flavor. And I, take, I try and take all of my experiments to as, different, as many different countries as possible because otherwise I'm just getting this really narrow um, view of the association. So I took this, I was teaching in India for a little while, so um, I asked the students to do this and most of them actually picked A. And when I asked them why they picked A, um, they explained that it's nostalgia, it's childhood, and these serif typefaces are just um, sig um, code for nostalgia or tradition. And then they also laughed at me for bringing Western chili flakes that they'd just put on pizzas. Um, so then what was wonderful was they went home, raided their mom's spice drawers, spice cupboards, and bought in like lots of different chili flavors. And we repeated the, um, we repeated the experiment, but with all of the Indian chilies, which was, which was so much more fun. Um, this was another one. So um, imagine I'm giving you lavender. So think about the smell of lavender. Hands up if you would pair that with A. Oh, that's quite popular. Hands up, B. Any Bs? No Bs? Oh, yes, there's one. Oh, I'm not going to make you shout, but I'd like to know later why you made, why you made this association. Um, so I did this in my studio. We had about 20 or 30 people in the studio. Nearly everybody picked um, the curvy typefaces, the A's or the kind of um, Bodoni italics, so things that were curvy and quite traditional. But then three people at different points in the room picked B. And all of us were like, why? <laughs> um, and I started asking, and it turns out, even though they were standing separately, they were all flatmates. And then when I asked more and more, it turned out that the air freshener in their toilet was lavender scented. <laughs> so they had very unique cultural experiences um, that for them linked the smell of lavender with warning, go away, come back later. Um, nobody on social media admitted to that, so these were the kind of descriptions I got on social media. And I think they're wonderful, they're so poetic. Um, Christmas Fate 1955, isn't that lovely? So what I am now, so having done this for about five years, um, any of you who've been to any conferences um, that I've been to with my pop-up lab will have taken part in this, and if ever you find me, come and, come and do this. Um, but it means that I'm starting to be able to build up these really comprehensive 
maps of different typefaces or different moods associated with the different typefaces. So this is stressed to disgusted, so everything from allergies through to smelly rooms, feeling sick, bad drinking memories, and disappointment. I love that disappointment is those heavy, blocky ones on the right. Now, of course, my, um, my smells are nice. I'm really not going to ask you to smell anything horrible, because why would I do that? The whole point is to make you have a bit of fun. Um, but the thing, of course, is that I can't control your associations or your experiences. And one of my favorite things to demonstrate this, favorite smells to demonstrate this, is licorice. So I'm going to ask you all to think about, imagine I've given you a jar of licorice, you're smelling it. Which of these typefaces would you associate it with? So hands up A, hands up B. Ooh, that's pretty much half and half, which, is what, which bears out when I do this experiment a lot of the time. So again, I'm going to refer to my very scientific social media answers here. Um, so what I find, and also when I do this live, is the smell of licorice is either happy, nostalgic, old-fashioned childhood memories, it's all sweet and lovely, or it's that Zambuca ha hangover that you have because you went out after the after party or after the party last night, you went out clubbing. Um, and the, both of the shapes of the different typefaces, the angular, aversive typeface kind of bears that out. So I'm going to finish by talking a little bit about synesthesia. So this so synesthesia, has, does anybody in this room know that they have synesthesia? It's a really interesting, oh, maybe a hand or two. Um, it's a really interesting thing where your, br your brain connects your senses in ways that are, slightly un that are possibly unusual, or maybe unusual is not the right word. Um, some people can taste sounds some people for some people letters have particular colors um, and they the thing about synesthesia is apparently about 10 percent of the population has it but you might not know because we just presume that everybody experiences the world the way we do so while not everybody actually has synesthesia we all have a form of learned synesthesia where we learn to match different um, to make different associations. So there is a particular, yellow, particular shade of yellow that we would all know tastes of lemon. And if, while we've been talking, or if, if while I've been talking about the smells, um, I have now created this situation where you look at these different typefaces and you now know what they smell like, then I have, you are experiencing a form of learned olfactory grapheme synesthesia. So olfactory smell, grapheme words, and then synesthesia is the way that these two have now become linked. I like my sound. <laughs> um, and so what I'm hoping that for the next day, at least, you're going to wander around um, thinking about what different typefaces might smell like, what they might taste like. And this is my very last slide. <laughs> Um, if you would like to join me in my mission to change the way that we talk and think about type, um, these are the various different ways to follow, find, talk, join in. Um, and I would love to also talk to anybody who's got any questions or observations later on. So thank you very much.